<laughs> Welcome to the show, Jorge. Jorge, George. How do you prefer? Um, George. George. Yeah. George. Thank you so much for coming to the show and for coming to the studio. I really appreciate your time. I know you're, it's a bit of a drive and we've been talking about this for a long time, <laughs> for a yeah. very long time. So I'm happy that we're able to make it happen today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just before we're talking about podcasts, because as you know, I am not the most podcast savvy person. And so I'm always looking to learn and improve um, what I'm doing. And you mentioned that you work with hybrid and do a lot of their podcasts like What's that like? Um, so, yeah, I, I work for Hybrid Performance Method. I'm the main podcast producer. And what's that like is that generally episodes come out every Thursday. We're on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Just shoot it beforehand. I usually, I usually can edit a full podcast video and then like five clips with like subtitles and like funny uh, funny inserts and stuff. And then the audio and then uploading on YouTube, I can usually do that within a whole day. Mm -hmm. So that so I just shoot it. it tends to be at like 5.30 mm -hmm. um, p.m. And then the next day I shoot it. I, sorry, next day I edit it all within the day and it's all ready. Yeah. What's like, what have you learned from the process? Like, did you know about editing podcasts before you started working with hybrid? No. I did not know anything about editing podcasts specifically. Yeah. I actually had never even handled like a sound, a separate sound recorder. Really? Usually I would just like record audio straight into the camera mm -hmm. for anything that I would do. And, but first of all, a separate sound recorder, if you don't like split your audio, you have to start doing it. Yeah. It's the best thing ever. Because the data is like so heavy, you can really manipulate it. Um, but yeah, like I would never record like on a separate audio recorder. I had never edited like a, a show. And what I did first, I would not have for the first clips I would do, I would not have um, captions. Okay. But then pretty early on, like an episode after I would add captions and then uh, I would go through like the creative process. Like, are those captions big enough? Do I have to like auto caps everything? You know, what fits, you know, social media the best, what fits TikTok the best, you know, what's eye grabbing. So then I, so then after some evolutions of like, okay, got to add captions. Okay. Um, got to make them bigger. Okay. <laughs> Let me not add a, like any specific grammar, like periods mm -hmm. and everything, because that just takes up like editing time, right. like trying to like overanalyze your grammar. Right. Just have it be the words, have them come on fast, you know, change font and color size, just to hit keywords. And yeah, you just, it's just trial and error, especially to see what, how, what works on social media. It's got to be like a lot more direct and like eye catching. And then before what I was doing before, it was it was a lot more just talking to the camera and very like you're watching a documentary. It's just subtitles on the bottom mm -hmm. and it's just very direct, long sentences. But then I eventually evolved to all, uh, big letters, all caps, no periods. So no like over in dated commas mm -hmm. and, and the words come out fast. So yeah. it's like, it tends to be like two words per, um, like half a second. Okay. In order to like, cause, uh, cause if somebody misses, misses something and this is what I found out, um, human psychology right now, if somebody misses like any single word, even though they might be hearing it, they, and if there's captions on top of the video they're gonna want to re-watch it because they have to match whatever it is they heard with whatever it is they read if not then you if not then kind of like the brain data and the data in your brain kind of like misplaced and oh. it's just like it doesn't completely register so you have to if you're hearing it you also have to read it and if they're going by too fast, then it increases. This is like 
No, please keep going. I love it. I love this. <laughs> this is like how Facebook analyzes human like psychology to get people to stay on more. Yeah. But yeah, fast, fast, faster letters and um, sh- shorter letters within a shorter period. Somebody's bound to like not read a word. Right. But that's actually on purpose because then you'll get the get a replay out of them. Oh, so you're saying I should purposely like misspace the text to the video so that make people rewatch it. Well, no, not miss space, <laughs> but like have the words come on so fast, like. Gotcha. Like, uh, like if I was talking right now, it it, it would be like if uh, it would be like, and then and then that word would disappear. If I was talking right now, like it would be just one consecutive word really fast. But right. some people don't catch on to it because they're too busy listening. Mm-hmm. But then they'll annoy them in their brain and be like, I, I, I only listen, I have to read it too. So then you get another play out of them. It's like, okay, I'm listening, but I'm also intently trying to track the captions. Right. Because they're going by so fast. Now that you say that, I, I catch myself doing that too. Like if I miss, I'm like, maybe I don't trust what I saw. So I need to go yeah. back and reread it to make sure that what I saw is what I actually heard. Or what I heard is what I saw. That's crazy. How did you figure that out? Um, Just basic human psychology like most people most people actually if the content is engaging actually care to know what actually happened in the content Mm. and if you actually care about something you're gonna be a slightly bothered if you're not like 100 percent knowledgeable especially if it's like a fitness and health topic Mm -hmm people want like that specific information perfectly right because if not um they, it's almost as if like they're missing like key parts of the information mm-hmm. like how do you increase like your deadlift pr well i just missed like three words out of that i got um uh i gotta go back and rewatch it because it, it was just it's very important for me and i really want to increase my snatch and or Dell FPR. Um, and yeah, it's just if somebody cares about something and the content is engaging, they're gonna rewatch it to in order to like fill in those gaps in their brains. I love that. And how long did it take you to realize? Is it something that just was it from the beginning that you knew that correlation, or was it something that you figured out over time that the psychology behind watching a video and hearing a video? It's something that I knew all along, yeah. but I didn't really register it with me un- until I until I started really intensely watching the clips by myself. Mm. Like when you edit them, I don't really intensely watch it and like I, I, I have my own specific details in my edits. Like I do like swipe in for funny stuff, like I make the clip more engaging if the scene and the conversation is like an as a, at a so so funny point i make it even more funny mm-hmm. with like i inserting a bunch of memes and videos and stuff but i wouldn't really like intensely be watching it for the actual message i would just only be interacting with it for just work right for just okay i gotta edit this i gotta make it more funny but i'm not but it's like going in one ear coming out the other right it used to be like that. Um, but um, I always knew that. So I did. So I had like long sentences, like around eight to 10 word sentences that, w- and they would just change. Mm-hmm. Um, but they wouldn't be really be going fast. And after that, after I started like rewatching a bunch of my clips, because I would show them to my girlfriend a lot, she I would be rewatching it outside of the editing environment. Right. And then I would be like, hmm, that could be better <laughs> now that I'm watching it, like as a viewer, showing it to my girlfriend. Right. So then I just started editing like that. I was like, okay, I know what that needs. I love it. And then I don't want to get too much into video because I do want to talk about your photography, which I think is incredible. Um, but I do have a question. So you work with this company, and so they, they give you the freedom to try different techniques when it comes to your work? Like, is that an environment where you're able to, okay, maybe let me try this and see how people engage with it on this way, or let me edit this out? Like, do you have that freedom of, of being able to try new techniques? Because that's oh, super important. Oh, hybrid is completely hands-off. Really? They, very, very cool. They just, 
let me let me do what i want that's amazing like that's the ideal client the client that lets you because um and you can tell me how your experience has been it's super hard to work with a client that's like over your shoulders when it comes to you being creative right and in my experience the ones that tell that tell you okay our objective is x y and z this is what we want as a final goal like to be stated in the in the video in the picture whatever the case is how you get there is on you Right. And so when they give you the freedom to get there with your own creative input, I think those are the best clients because then it's it's like, cool, you're working with a purpose for sure. But then you get to be you in that process. Like you don't lose yourself in trying to be so structured and so rigid like a yeah. lot of other clients do. I think uh, a good thing is when you're an outsider editing content for something that you're not like usually too familiar with because I think having an outsider's perspective on say video editing or podcast editing or educational editing for fitness and health is good because one you can do your own research while you're editing it so you get all your information correct so you yourself learn at the same time Mm -hmm. but also two that the client might want something specific and from their very highly educational um, brain in this specific niche they have a very like idiosyncratic way of doing this specific thing but it's not the most best it's not the best and most efficient way to deliver the information to the mass general audience mm-hmm. so i think having an outsider's perspective when it comes to editing content for niches like health and fitness is always a great thing because you can make it more um digestible to a wider audience 100 percent, and that's what health and fitness is all about it's like it's not just we want to stay in our own little corner it's like no health and fitness is a shared thing like we want everybody to be healthy and fit and all that yeah so how you deliver it it's, and it's, it's something that i've told people clients before uh, how you deliver it to somebody who you want to watch your content is different than how you would deliver it to somebody like yourself who's knowledgeable. Like if you know yeah. about the topic, you're going to hear it differently than somebody who doesn't know. And so a lot of people who don't know and want to get into it, they need to receive it in a way that like that isn't as intimidating or isn't, that isn't as technical or that isn't as, as super superfluous to to how you, we would digest it, right? Yeah. Like it has to be like edible, like edible, right? It has to be something where not every, like... There's a saying that I heard, not everyone can eat steak, right? So some people need vegetables, some people need rice and beans. And so it's how you deliver that information that will appeal to the people, to the most people as possible. Yeah, it's like as if we were to go up to somebody on on a random street and be like, okay, I think you need to shoot more wide open. (laughs) And they're going to be like, what do you mean wide open? (laughs) It's like, okay, you see that little uh, aperture A button right there? Just like t- bring a tiny bit lower. Yeah, it's a completely different, same message, completely different delivery. Yeah. So that's actually a cool segue. Um, normally, I start off every podcast and I ask the my guest what cameras they work with and what like what is their go to cameras and their go to um, lenses for any shoot. We start off a little bit differently, but I want to come back to that because you made a video about your gear. I don't know when, like a couple weeks ago. And you had every one of your cameras. Oh, yeah. All my film cameras. All, well, your film. all my photography cameras. Yeah. So, okay, break it down for me for the, the people who don't know your work. Um, photography cameras or just photo and video cameras? Oh, okay. So for photo cameras, I'm a big film lover, even mm-hmm. though I don't get to shoot too much film because it's very expensive nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, but for film cameras, I don't have a, I don't have a 120 millimeter camera and I kind of find that like uh unnecessary for now but i have a canon a1 came in out in like 1983 i have a canon this was that that's a, a slr i have a canon 35 m2 and that's a point and shoot that came out in the 80s too and then i also have a contax g1 which came out in 1991. And when it came out, the retail price was $3,000. Wow. Yeah. And it has a Zeiss lens on it. Okay. 28 millimeters. My um, Canon A1, I have a 50 millimeter 1.8, 
which I have an FD to E-mount adapter. So you can use it on your Sony? So I can use it on my Sony. Oh, and wow. that leads me to my Sony, where I have a Sony A7R2. Back when I was shopping for cameras, which was like a year and a half ago, um, I was caught on a crossroads of choosing within a specific price range. And at that point, the Sony A7 III, which was 150 bucks more than the A7R2, because the A7R2 is a camera from 2015, mm -hmm. or the Sony A7R2, I just knew that I had to be within that specific price point. So it was like, what would I value? Higher resolution or like dual SD card and like slightly <laughs> better autofocus. So at that point I was like, okay, I'm gonna just go with the seven year old, uh, six year old camera at that point because I need the higher resolution because I'm a, I'm a heavy cropper. Right. And I like detail shots and everything. And when you're shooting fashion portraits, you know, when I'm going into like, cause I read such like the slightest little detail. Mm -hmm. I'm, I really want to actually be able to see the pixel. Right. So that's why I went with a six year old camera instead of the Sony a seven three. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 42 megapixels. I have my favorite lens is a 35 millimeter. That's the best focal length. You can't argue with me. <laughs> I, I will argue with you. So Whoa, okay. we'll argue with that. Um, <laughs> So when I started shooting, I started shooting only video. Like I was a videographer before I was a photographer. And my first lens was a 35 millimeter. Okay. So I loved, I grew up, I used the 35 millimeters prime only for, for years for shooting video. But I was also in the fitness industry. So all I shot were gym videos for the long, that's how I got started. Only doing gym videos. I didn't take one photo. If somebody wanted some photos, I'd be like, I'm not your guy. Like I'll hold the phone for you and I'll take some photos on your cell phone. But I won't, I did not shoot photos on a camera. It was only strictly video. And the only lens I used was a 35 millimeter. That's the only one I ever wanted to use. And it wasn't until I shot with an 85 millimeter wow. for photo for the first time. And I was in love with the 85 millimeter. In love with it. Granted, you got to be like 10 miles away to get a full body in the for video. That's the, that's <laughs> the reason why I can't go a longer focal length. Mm -hmm. Because... With the 35, I'm, I'm a type of photographer that I love moving around. I love right. zipping around. So the 35 is perfect for me because it's not too wide to the point where I always have to be super close, but mm -hmm. it's not too far to the point where I always have to be pretty far. Mm -hmm. So it's like I can move around, zip around, and I, that's just it's just more fun to, for me to shoot like that. That's just like my shooting style. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, that's why I can't go like a longer focal length. I would, I, I have another lens. Oh boy. That one's a zoom lens. That's an 18 to 105. Okay. It's an APS-C lens though, so. You get that crop? Yeah, I get that 1.5 times crop, but I only use it for video. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't affect video quality whatsoever. Right. Um, so 18 to 105 APS-C, which translates to like a 28 to 150 mm -hmm. on my full frame. Mm -hmm. F4, um, and it has optical image stabilization. And I mainly use that for like shooting fitness, for shooting video. Okay. Why that? That's such a wide focal length, right? Is there a specific reason why that lens? Because I can really play with people's proportions mm. with the distortion of the lens. Interesting. Because I don't want to keep swapping out to uh, to f like five different primes, right? To be able to play with um people's proportions, and I feel like it's not just framing when it comes to photography. It's also manipulating perspective, mm -hmm. and I and depending on the lens that you shoot, obviously there's distortion. Um, you can really adjust the energy and the mood. And the intimacy of an edit, depending on how you shift your focal lengths. Can you break that down more? Because that's super interesting to me. Like, can you break down a shoot where that was the, the thought process? So like, recently I did a shoot with, for hybrid with Noah Olsen and mm -hmm. we shot some video. Um, and 
when I would be very far, there would be three people working out in front of me on the row machine. I would have my full calling fat like 30, okay. which is like 40 two in um, full frame. And for that, I would be pretty far away. I would be in the middle of the street and it would just be a great big vista. So then I would cut and then I would actually get on top of a wall. I would just parkour up that wall <laughs> and get on top there. And from the wall, I, I'm at an overhead shot. I have an overhead shot, but my lens is all the way in. So, so at 150. Okay. So it changes the mood of the edit because one, you can... Okay, you go from a wide shot, but then you go all the way in. Mm -hmm. But then you go all the way in from an angle that you didn't think you were going to go in. Right. Because now it's just like, whoa, I'm really in there with him. I'm really in a more intimate setting. setting Because it's just like, I'm, I'm from the spectator, and then I'm suddenly pushed into a more intimate setting. And it's just like, wow, that feels very nice. Whereas if you have a metal shot there... So, it, which works like 99% of the time, but if you have a middle shot there, it's kind of like more progressional, like, okay, I'm out, and then I'm like more closer in, like it's more of a full body shot, and then, it, then it's the close up. Mm -hmm. Then it's just like, it feels more like, okay, I'm watching a sports game. Right. Because the camera's like pushing in more and stuff. Meanwhile, like if you do like an a, abrupt cut, which try to not make it feel abrupt, it can go from uh, an evolution of the relationship with the content of the viewer with whoever is in the frame. Right. Well, so that's my thought process revolving. I love yeah. that. I love it. I think especially for fitness too. So I think one of the things that attracts um, a viewer to watch a fitness video or to keep engaged with the fitness video from my experience is just, like you said, the idea of being there almost. And yeah. seeing the sweat fall down and seeing the intensity and feeling it. It's one thing to see somebody work out from far away. It's another thing to, like you said, be in the shot almost and see them row and see that energy and see that, that intensity. And that's really what motivates anyone to, to continue watching a video and what excites somebody to get those emotions that you want out of a fitness video, right? Like yeah. a lot of them are very exciting and they're very, or they're very dramatic or, um, question. So you, were you, when you were doing that shot, were you out, outdoors? Yeah, I was outdoors. So one of the hardest parts for me when I was doing fitness was getting the lighting right. Because how you light um, an exercise it changes the entire mood for it. Um, when you shot that, were you like what day? What time of the day was it? Midday, oh, one so p.m. Up here. Yeah, completely. <laughs> Why? <laughs> like, I try to avoid anything between like eleven and three. I'm like I'm at home. I am not outside at all. I do that for photo uh -huh. because for photo, a photo is, stag is static. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have time to really sit with the <laughs> harsh lighting. Yeah. But for video and for fitness, you're moving so fast and you're making, you might make like a lot of cuts that it, ju it, that it just doesn't stay with you. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, so, I mean, can I show you right here? Of course, here? please. So, yeah, this is all midday. I have some shots where, sorry. Some inside gym shots, but I don't really worry too much about like. Oh yeah, so it doesn't even look overexposed at all in the slightest. Yeah, your exposure is perfect. Oh, yeah. It's very cool. So you combined outdoor shots with indoor shots? In this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that, uh, that specific reel, I edited it towards the progression of the exercises. So like you know, how many exercises they did in what order. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I should, as long as, because I use a, Monitor, monitoring monitor that has an ex um the color exposure thing i forget what it's called the metering false color yeah. so that uses false color i 
as long as your skin tone is either like a lightish gray or a green, you're good. Like it doesn't matter how you shoot outside. Cool. Okay. And that was with my Sony, which only shoots 8-bit. 8, 8, 10, 822? Huh? 8, 8 bit 822 or 8102, 1082? Because like a mice, like R4 shoots 10, 8, 10, 8, 8, I think. 10 bit 8, 8. The lowest you can imagine. <laughs> I, for, I forget the, the specifics of that, but I yeah. know it shoots 8 bit. Uh -huh. So there's not much flexibility in terms of like color grading. Oh. So, yeah. For for that, I don't really use the Sony too much for video when it comes to my own stuff, like things separate from hybrid. When it comes to fitness, like you don't need that much color, right? Right. right. Um, so I'm, so like the Sony is like more than enough with the lenses that I have to like not push the footage and make it noisy. Right. Um, but yeah, that was with 8-bit. So it's like, I don't even have much flexibility with like trying to, with the highlights, with the whites, trying to color grade it to make it not seem as harsh. So even so, uh, what matters is just just dial in your settings. That's that's the most important thing. Hundred um, percent. I want to go back to more of your work because you have a really cool style, and I don't know how to describe it. So, I when I see like for example, my favorite model that you shoot with is Stephanie, and I love shooting with Stephanie too. Um, she's still dope. And so you do like a lot of cool work with her. Like, um, I think you have one of your pin posts is Stephanie. And oh, yeah. Yeah, she's super cool. Um, and when I see your work, I feel like it's very, the styling is very modern. I think the one with Stephanie was like the Matrix. That's what well was in the caption. Um, mm -hmm. But it still gives me a vibe like it's, like I'm still getting that grainy, almost like, I don't know, it's weird. Like, it's like I'm watching a modern movie on an old TV. If that makes sense. It's I like, like that. <laughs> that's that's what it feels like. It feels like I'm watching like a current, like a movie that came out today, but on a TV from the 70s or the 80s. Like that vibe is what you give me. Like it's super, super cool. Like it's just, you have yeah. a really cool vibe to you. And all the things that you do in the city, it's really, really cool. Like how did you come up with that? Like is that something that you gradually grew into? Is that, was that intentional? Um, no, that was there from the start. Yeah. I have I have never really changed really. I I've always I I've always shot with the intention of making stuff feel like as if you were looking at a movie. Cuz that's really that's what I want to do at the end of the day. I right. I'm a director and I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. Aspiring director and writer. So ultimately that's what I want to do and that that just bleeds into like everything that I shoot. Right. Like, if it doesn't have, like, a cinematic quality to it, then I'm probably... That's probably not me. <laughs> so, when it when it comes to, like, what do we classify as cin cinematic, mm -hmm. there is no hard, like, rules or, like, specific definition. But to me, I've always seen it as just there being an air to it there being a softness it not looking too digital and that's um and that's also another problem when you have a high resolution camera like how 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 do i take away the digital feel how do i not make it seem like you can look into somebody's pores and it's just you you just try to make it like as if it was from a movie soften it up tiny bit i'm not i don't should i give specifics on the settings be specific, yeah be specific with it um decontrast your photos that's the number one thing <laughs> you made it so simple i thought you were gonna go really technical okay okay <laughs> no I, but I, I, like, I like simple simple is good decontrast your photos lowers the lower the whites a little bit crush your highlights that's for sure crush the highlights um raise your blacks get in that like like the black start to look a little bit grayish mm -hmm. so raise them on their s curve 
and slightly lower your shadows to bring back a tiny bit of contrast. Mm -hmm. And then there you have like a more softer cinematic look. Right. How did you get to that? Was that just trial and error? Or did you look at a specific source of inspiration? Uh, trial and error because I've never watched a video to learn how to edit. Oh, so you've been a gangster since day one? <laughs> yeah, the most that I would watch is like, is if I don't know like how to do something like in video editing. So like, I don't know how to go to this setting. Like, what's this setting in Adobe? Like, how do I go to the speed ramping mm -hmm. setting? And it's like, okay, thank you. I'm done with you. And then, and then I just figure out everything from there. Like, is it the most time efficient way to do it? No, but does it teach me the most? Yeah, because there's a saying, can you curse on this? You can do whatever you want. Fuck around and find out. <laughs> Fuck around and find out, 100%. Yeah, I feel like that's the best way to learn anything, or at least that's like my core tenant to myself is fuck around and find out. Mm -hmm. Like I've taught myself guitar, piano, I've taught myself photography, video and the mo the only thing that i've ever like used as a resource is in terms of my film writing because you got to learn from the best mm -hmm. when, when it comes to filmmaking but photography and pretty much anything else i've always just taught by myself no i love that it's very very impressive because i'm not that good right and so there's something where i look at my work i'm very very self-critical of my work right and I feel like I'm so self-critical that I need to look at other people's work to see like what I'm missing, right? Or look on YouTube and see maybe I'm not learning enough or maybe there's something that I should learn that I don't know. Like the best questions are the ones that you don't know you should ask, right? Those are, that's always how I always thought I saw everything. And so I was always trying to like bombard myself with knowledge from different sources. And so I really respect that you were just like, fuck around and find out with it because it's very, very difficult because sometimes for me like what i don't know is what hurts me but you're like fuck it i'm gonna figure it out i'm gonna f accidentally find out and and because because you're doing so much of it so it's yeah. super super impressive that you do that i mean i used to be hypercritical of my own work too and compare my work a lot to other photographers but mm -hmm. never in the sense of i gotta do exactly what he's doing right yeah i would just be like what's just the overall quality like what's what's the overall quality to it not what he's doing specifically but the quality of his work like how does it make me feel how much of an right. emotional connection is it bringing out of me that would be the only thing i would compare myself to right. and then at a certain point i just stopped doing it because i just realized it's just it's just taking too much away time like me sitting there scrolling on my phone looking at other photographers work uh comparing myself to them and their work is just like it's 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 taking away valuable time for me to just practice right i don't watch youtube videos so it's taking away time from me fucking around i like that a lot so i might look at another photographer's work and be like okay they uh I, I I would just uh, and I would just using my own knowledge and how much I fucked around, just try to analyze how did they get the photo to look that way, and it would just be a practice of like like technicalities oh, and just like okay he raised the blacks he raised the exp he he lowered the exposure crushed the highlights raised the whites or up the highlights and stuff and so that I do occasionally just to like practice my brain mm -hmm. but I but I never go into Lightroom or Photoshop and be like okay I'm looking at a photo on my uh, one monitor and I'm trying to replicate that editing on this monitor like I never I never right. go to that extent because right. it doesn't that doesn't, doesn't matter, matter to me right it's always just like I'm just doing this on my phone like I just see a random photo for one second and be like okay I jot down all, all the or what he could have possibly done and i just move on with my life mm -hmm. and, it, and it was just like quick little exercise in my brain right. photo editing you take like just little bits of the technique almost or, or maybe yeah i like i like how you said that you said um how they convey that emotion so i think it's super important and now that i'm a little bit i'm working my way up into the experience ladder when it comes to creating content um i find that 
trying to get emotion in a photo is my goal. Like, I want to convey some sort of emotion, whether it's sadness or or happiness or excitement, whatever the case is. And so I'm a lot more selective now with who I shoot with. It's because I want to be able to shoot with people who can help me convey emotion. And it's a very simple yeah. thing when it comes to emotion, right? It's a look, a smirk, um, looking in a specific direction. There's small things that then you can build off of. When, then in post, you can always edit to, to the mood, right? But yeah. if I can capture the emotion in the moment and then just build off of that emotion more when I edit, when it comes to colors and stuff like that, that's really what my goal is now. And you do it a really, really good, like, again, I'm going to give you your props because you are really, really good at making things look super cool. And that's what I like a lot about your work. Like, you're one of the photographers who have, like, the most safe stuff because your work is, like, it's awesome. Like, I I feel like I'm watching a superhero movie when I see your work. And I don't know if that's intentional or that's just my interpretation of it all. You have a really cool way of just, like you even mentioned earlier, you crop in a specific way. Um, the way your series go together, like, your slides go together, it's very, very interesting. Like, could you walk me through that process of... What do you look for when it comes to the model with the location? Like... Can you walk me through like a, a shoot? Um, a fashion shoot is usually what I shoot most of, mm -hmm. of out of like the big shoots that I do. Mm -hmm. So fashion shoot, I did one fashion shoot at a park. Didn't really like it. Wow. Um, just not my vibe. Like at the end of the day, like I was just like, eh, too much green. <laughs> too much green? Eh, yeah, too much green. <laughs> I want to do all this. <laughs> um so uh so after that i really like yeah uh finalize that i my preferred location hundred and ten thousand percent would always be either in an alleyway or a city setting your city stuff is what i what comes to mind automatically when i think about your work like if like if we're shooting in front of a white wall and there's like i don't like graffiti because there's like graffiti can take away too much or can take away from the photo so it's like but if we're shooting in front of a white wall and it has a line going up so i'll use that as a leading line and if there's like a black stain like two huge black stains on both sides of the wall it's like perfect i love that i love that because that's like not everything has to be clean things things can just be like how they are like the best films you'll ever see is just like let's take quentin tarantino films for example you look at the writing those are just actual conversations people have people talk like people in his films right they have like witty fun conversations that you would have with your friends and stuff and it's a, the same goes for like any art so when it comes to visuals it's just like just have it be natural like if there's a, if there's a stain in the in the front of in the wall right there it's fine like my style is not i have to make things super clean super magazine like and it's just like i don't care about that i i I'd much rather have it give give it an edge give it a feeling she looks so cool like <laughs> i love it so so then i have like and then depending on the photo, I like have two different, very, very different like editing styles. Like right now I've kind of landed in, looks natural, but still it has like a very cinematic look to it. And then my other editing style is it really looks like, I don't know, um, very green tinted in the shadows, like a bit of contrast, but like a very poppy film. And those are generally my two editing styles. And like, just depending on the photo, like, uh, like the grungier it is. And if I, if I use flash, definitely uh, my film type editing, but like the grungier it is, the more, the more grunge I go into that editing. Okay. Um, but like, it's, it doesn't have to be, um, not not everything has to be perfect all uh, there's a there's a saying all eight equal a ten like if you if if you're if you're posing is at an eight but if your background is at an eight if your makeup is at an eight if your hair is at an eight if the composition's at an eight 
or the leading Zangs and an eight, those will all equal a 10 at the end of the day. Because all ultimately what matters in um, any visual art is the overall look. Right. People can nitpick your work all the, all the time. But what really matters is the overall look because nobody's going into a photo and being like, Ugh, the, he didn't um, Photoshop out that like line that was okay that was on purpose i didn't want to photoshop out that line um or like just an accidental thing i was just like okay i should just use my time retouching her skin rather than just retouching the wall behind her so all eights equal a 10 because it's better to have everything be an eight than have your composition be a four because you're way too worried on trying to have it just look perfect. That makes a lot of sense. It's just like time efficiency. Uh, a problem is like, it's not going to be perfect. Just be satisfied with like an eight and it's going to look like a 10 overall. Right. Like if you're, I, I use Quentin Tarantino a lot and I use a lot of film mm -hmm. analogies and metaphors because that's ultimately what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, um, the shot where Mar where Marvin and Victor go in to interrogate um, one of the guys in the apartment. In Pulp Fiction? Yeah, in Pulp Fiction. And they, they shoot Actually the wall. my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> they shoot the wall. But if you look at the shot where he reacts, um, the bullet holes are already there. Mm -hmm. So it's just like in that shot, it's like if, if in film, continuity issues would be completely like, they'll be apparent, but it's like, just don't make them too obvious. Have it be an eight. And then overall, the film, the, the scene is going to be a 10. Right. Because if you, re if you remember that scene, is it's, it, it's hilarious because Mar um, Marin says, do you speak English, motherfucker? It's like, that, that's an I iconic line from that iconic scene. Mm -hmm. And it's like, does anybody remember the other bullet holes are oh. like there in that quick shot before he reacts? It's like, no, it's so quick. And the whole scene is so good overall that it's just like nobody's gonna realize it. Right. What? Say what again? I tell you. I double tell you, motherfucker. Say yeah. what again? <laughs> I love it. Um, besides Quentin Tarantino, who else inspires you? Um, like, I I only really have directors and writers as inspiration. Yeah. Not none of us Instagram people, huh? <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, there's this one guy I like mm -hmm. on Instagram. His name is With Luke. Okay. But he mainly shoots like um, landscape, travel stuff. I really like his stuff because it has a very cinematic, but also like, like he, the way he manipulates color makes you feel as if you're inside there. Um, makes you makes a look. Uh, the way he manipulates the color makes it feel really cold how it would be. But if you just looked at the raw, it's like the raw, like picture when it's not perfectly color edited, can't really convey the true emotions of how cold it would feel. You really have to blew it up, mm -hmm. lower the temperature. Um, but other than uh, with Luke, it's just filmmakers. And I would say probably my number one is not Quentin. My number one is Ingmar Bergman. Um, he's a Swedish director from the 50s. And my favorite film of all time is The Seventh Seal. And my degree is in philosophy. So the reason why I love that film is because it's, it's, it's such a philosophy-oriented film. And if you don't know what the seven seal, it came on 1957 and it's basically a knight comes back from the crusades and he goes here and he has to travel to go back to his um, castle to, the, to visit his wife and finally be home from his war. And when he, when he gets to the shore and he starts his journey, he sees death and death is like, I've come for you. And uh, the knight is completely... Uh, brushes them aside. He's like, no, it's not my time to die. I will continue on with my journey. So he continues on with his journey and two different films happen at that point. There is the film that is happening diegetically and then there is the film that's happening non-diegetically. 
So diegetically is when things are happening in the moment and they are real. And there are non-diegetically is when things are not happening in the moment and they are not real. I might have those two definitions sw swapped, but that's what they mean. Um, so like in how in a musical, they start singing uh, out of nowhere. It's like, that's all happening non-diegetically. Like that's not actually happening, but it's happening for the, con for the purpose of the stylization of the scene or the whole movie. So from that journey he takes, he starts having a non-diegetically chess game with death. Mm -hmm. And as he's playing death in this, on, in these separate scenes, they're not really happening, but they're happening. Um, he's, uh, he's trying to avoid chess, um, seeing if he could win the chess game, which is really just like a juxtaposition to him and his real self traveling to his mansion to try to avoid death that way, just trying to run away from death that way. And then on, on the road, he meets a struggling, struggling pair of actors, a drunkard at a bar, and, and I forgot who, who, who else is in his crew, but all people that are, are going to be close to death at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And so when they reach, oh, this is, these are spoilers. Spoil away, I love spoilers. This came on 1957. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you don't, if you haven't seen it yet, you deserve to get spoiled. Okay. So at the very end, the him, the knight, his wife, and all the people that they met along the way see death together at the same time, and it hits on death from all different perspectives. Like if you're a struggling actor, you haven't really achieved any success with your art craft. So how, how much meaning can you convey, can you say your life had? Mm -hmm. If you're a knight, you find out you fought off these, all these endless wars, like how much meaning did it really give to you at the end of the day if you're just gonna die right after you come back? Uh, the drunk card, you were there just being drunk at a pub, you kind of wasted your life away, most people would say. So uh, when you're faced with death at the end of it, like people from all like sectors of life, how do you grapple with the meaning of your life now that death has finally to come for you? And that film generally revolves around that, and that's why it's like one of my favorite films. And yeah, because it's very philosophy-oriented. Um, a lot of my, a lot of my favorite films are, tend to be very philosophy oriented because of my degree and cause that's my main interest mm -hmm. really. Um, and yeah, Igmar Bergman is a top inspiration. I had to say like a current one. Well, other than Quentin, cause he's still going <laughs> and others than Corsese cause he's still going. Because I don't want to like reference people from like past generations, but like current generation filmmakers, I would say Denis Villeneuve. Mm. I really love his way of making a very complex subject of not dumbing down a complex subject. So like I I love the. I love the Dune books mm -hmm. and I thought his version of Dune was perfect. I feel like he didn't over explain stuff. He had like a lot of visual cues to what was happening. It's like, if you want to pick up on stuff, if you don't realize stuff, watch it again. Right. And that's what I love about his work. And it's like, even though he's doing some big budget sci-fi films, he makes it like the artsy as you can. Like he doesn't spoon feed you information. Right. He makes you earn yeah. understanding. Yeah. And a lot of people can't handle that. That's the biggest problem with um, art. I, I don't want to get too much on the have, hit on too much on the film industry, but art as a whole now is that people want information spoon fed a bit right. too much, right. and it's just like you don't get too much. You don't get satisfaction from that. Like you put in like film or any art form is like putting out in hours at the gym. Like you put in those hours at the gym, it, it was brutal. You you but you earn that satisfaction. Like if you're not exercising your brain while watching a film, you're not gonna earn any satisfaction or like understanding. You, it's just like it's just in one out in one ear out the other. It's like just a visual like dopamine hit, right? Yeah. And 
I, I love that you brought that up because I find that people care less, well, not people, but especially on social media, we care less about the quality of the work. We care less about the story behind the work, about the, the purpose of the work. And we care just, and as we're watching content, we care more about just seeing a bunch of content. Like it's less value on one piece of content than there is on the totality of all the content that you're putting out consistently. Do you ever feel that way? Well, that's because content as a whole lessens the value of any given art. Definitely. Well, because this, this is the way I see content. Content is a product of the social media industry. And the social media industry is really just meant to keep you engaged from one thing to the other. But it's not meant to keep you engaged in one thing. Mm-hmm. It's not meant to give you like any like right life realization. It's not meant to convey philosophy in any sort of way. It's just meant to keep you engaged constantly, just consistent dopamine hits, even if they come at three to 15 second intervals. Mm-hmm. So content in general is designed to be very quick and forgettable because it's just that's just part of the social media machine it's like you have to make one thing all right next reel i have to focus on the next reel and the, the people that watched the previous reel probably won't even remember it mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll just watch the next reel the next room the next reel and it's just you just the artist is searching just for another way to just keep producing and the viewer is just searching for another way to just keep watching so because they're just doing producing and watching, I don't feel like there's much meaningful engagement with it. Like it doesn't stay with you. Like with the, an, uh, uh, there's a metric in social media. It's like engagement. Like, but really how engageful is it? You're engaging with the product as a whole, but, not, but never a specific work of art. Mm. So when a follower of yours engages with all your reels, like, okay, that's great. They're engaging with all your reels. You, you know, they're a real one. Um, but they're really just engaging with your, pro- with your product as a whole, but never a specific thing. Like they're not engaging with like, hey, I shot this video. It's like, okay, they're not really engaging with how you shot that video, how how much it meant to them, what emotion did they have you feel ultimately at the end of the day. So that's like the biggest problem with making quote unquote content for social media is that things don't stay with you. And because they don't stay with you, they ultimately don't have a lasting impact. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, if I go to a museum and I look at a painting at a wall, I'm going to remember that painting. I love art, so I'm going to remember that painting if it ever had a lasting impact on me. Like I went to the Met um, last year, and I forgot the artist's name, but there was a painting and a, a volcano, and there was somebody at the corner of the volcano, but like the way that the black smog and the flames were painted was just like one of the most darkly gothic, be- most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. But I remember that painting. I remember a lot of other stuff because Monet was there too in the Met. Um, but yeah, so content as a whole is not really art because it diminishes the way people engage with art. It's just, it's, if, if, we, if we see art as a meaningful engagement, content is just an unmeaningful engagement. You're just meant to go to the next, from one thing to the next. So then how do we, how do we find that meaning again? How do we put, how do we, it is frustrating, right? It's frustrating the fact that people just want content and they don't really care about it, right? They just want to see things, but they just care about the next thing you're going to post. So then how do we reintegrate meaning into our work? Or is that something that you think it's past us now? Like all we can do is just be part of the machine. How do you think that we can do that? When it comes to short form content, there can be no meaning because everything, because if, because the nature of short form content is that you watch it once, maybe you watch it two times, but then you move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you don't sit down and actually watch the thing. Like when it comes to short form content, I don't think there's any hope because just of the nature of how you consume it. But long form content, like I think YouTube is much better mm-hmm. in this in this space than social than Instagram or TikTok will ever be. Mm-hmm. Because 
you're there, you click on a YouTube video and you just sit down and watch it. And you actually really pay attention to it. Like, um, and some people make like an hour long documentaries on like this expose on like the liver King. And it's mm -hmm. like, I don't just see that as just content because a lot of work went into that. Yeah. And like, that's an hour long. Like I'm, I'm investing my time what? into this. Like, I really want to know, like, I'm not just here just to press like, and then move on. Right. You're not there for the dopamine hit. You're there yeah. for the knowledge that you're acquiring. Yeah. And that's what makes it a meaningful engagement. That's why I think YouTube is far better in terms of that. But like social media, social media, no, I don't think there's any hope as long as the content just stays short form because you're not able to really convey art when it comes to short form content. No, I, I love that. It's funny because this is a conversation I keep having with a lot of different creatives and it's, um, we're almost losing all losing hope with Instagram and TikTok because again, like you said, it, we're, we put in all this effort to create a piece of work that isn't really valued. But on YouTube, yeah, it's more valued. It seems to be something where people are actively looking to sit, right? They're actively yeah. looking to be able to sit down and watch and appreciate and engage with a piece of content. Like the documentary for Liver King, the, I call it documentary because when I was watching it, it felt like it a, is documentary, a documentary, right? And it was an hour long. And I don't remember the last time that I sat down and watched a piece of content for an hour, but I watched that entire thing from start to finish. And again, I remember, like it's something where I can remember key points of that. And if you ask me what were the last five TikTok videos I saw, I have no idea. Or the last five Instagram pictures, I have no idea, right? Because on Instagram and TikTok, I'm just swiping and consuming, right? Yeah. I mean, first thing I did when I woke up was I, I go right to Instagram. Yeah, like for that dopamine hit. We, but we I don't, don't even remember know. anything I saw yeah, today at all. Like you, you don't even know if you can walk, and you're at first you're on the on the phone, right? Like, you know, yeah, you know, it's crazy, and it's um, it's a little scary too. Like um, it's scary how addicted we are, and I and I don't use the word addicted lightly. Like it's really really scary how addicted we are. Um, there's an app that I downloaded a month ago called One Sec, and on that app, pretty much you can you can aggregate, uh, integrate like so, uh, different apps that you use all the time, like Instagram, TikTok, whatever the case is, to One Sec. And what it does is, when you open up Instagram, it forces you to breathe, like do a breathing exercise for a minute before it opens up the app, right? And so, and then it makes you say, I hit Instagram, One Sec automatically opens up. And it's like a timer. It goes down and then it goes back up and then you can use Instagram. Bro, by yeah. the time I see the stupid timer go halfway, I'm already annoyed and I turn off the Instagram and I go do whatever I have to do because it for, like I'm, I just want to get on there so bad that having to wait annoys me, right? So I end up not yeah. even logging into Instagram or TikTok or whatever the case is unless I really have to go on there for some specific reason. And then the cool part too is that every time that I try to open up the app, it adds half a second to how long I have to wait. And so if I try to open up the app 20 times, it adds 10 seconds. If you, the amount of time you, you try to open up the app within 24 hours, it add half a second. So if I try to open it up 20 times within a day, it will add 10 more seconds of me having to wait to be able to use the app again. I need to download this app. Yeah, so it's crazy. So I have it for, um, for TikTok and Instagram because that's just, I'm just like that. Like I'm so like unconsciously looking to open it. Even if I'm doing something unconsciously, if I have to wait more than a second to do anything, I'm on my phone trying to get on Instagram. Yeah. Like it's just an unconscious habit at this point. But with one sec, it, like at the moment I see the timer, I get upset and I put my phone away because yeah. I don't want to wait. Now, if I have a purpose, like, okay, cool. I need to make sure that um, I message you or I'm waiting for a DM from somebody that I need something like whatever the case is. If I'm going in there with purpose, then it's like, cool, I don't mind waiting because I know what I'm going in there for. But yeah. if I'm not going with purpose, like mind, mindlessly scrolling, it'll stop me and I'll look at it. I'm like, I don't even want to, I don't really don't even want to open up the app. Like I have no reason to be on this app right now, except me being bored. And so I forcing me to turn, the, turn my phone off. That's my biggest problem right now is I am me mindlessly scrolling through Instagram because there's so much, so many better things I could be doing with my time. 100%. Like I love films. I love writing and directing. And I could, I could be finishing the screenplay, like my five screenplays that I have like 90% finished each of them instead of just scrolling through Instagram. I could just be watching more films. Like that's something that ever since I've really started to like 
become a professional photographer ever, like a year and a half ago because that's when I bought my Sony. Mm-hmm. I would, um, ever since then, I would, sh- uh, I would be so, uh, my Instagram time would like skyrocket. Right. And ever since then, I've just been watching less films. And it's just like, that's not good no. f- n- that for a director and an, for an aspiring director and writer and aspiring filmmaker. That is the worst thing you can do because you're not, you know, you're not getting inspired and you're also like not seeing what works, um, discovering new films, new styles and stuff. So it's like, the, and films are like the most successful thing in the world. So it's like, you can do it at any time watching a film. So it's like, but also Instagram is cause it's on my, cause it's on my phone. And if I'm like meaningly spending time on my phone for no reason, like that takes away time from my own development, whether it's like learning or just actually producing stuff, like we're finished writing my screenplays. It's so difficult. Yeah, no, it, it's, again, it, it's scary how dependent we are on that. And so it's something where anything that forces me to like not scroll, I appreciate. So I'll definitely check out that app because I feel like I always recommend it to everybody that I meet. Like yeah. download the app and use it because even making you wait for 30 seconds before you go on there, it's like, a for, okay, do I really want to go on there or am I just bored, right? And the moment yeah. you question, you ask yourself that question, it's like, I have so much thing, so many things that I need to do. And it just completely changes my trajectory. So I, I love that app. <laughs> Definitely get on there if, um, if you need it. Um, yeah. Bro, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank I you. know we've been trying to do this for a minute. And so I appreciate you taking the time out to come on and to share with me your journey, your experiences, your story, your processes, your methodology, I think. I think you're so gifted, bro, and I'm excited to see what else you create. And I'm one of your number one fans, so please keep creating and get off Instagram, please. Okay. Um, I, before we leave, I want to, where can people find you and your work? So on Instagram, my name is at George, J-O-R-G-E, so the Spanish version of George, <laughs> Clins, K-L-I-N-S. And that will be the same thing on TikTok and my website is the same thing, but www.georgeclins.com. I, same thing on YouTube, George Clins. And yeah, that's where you can find me everywhere. Are there any films that you're producing soon that are releasing that we should know about? Film, short films, anything like that? Anything, any cool passion projects that you have coming out? So my, I am currently in the process of writing my first real short film because I've I've made stuff and I would just I would title it short. I shouldn't title my stuff shorts because they would really just serve as practice for like composition, framing, color grading and stuff. And I've uploaded them, called them shorts. They're they're not shorts. <laughs> um, so content like dilutes the art, and I've been diluting the term short film. So I'm part of the problem. Um, so. I'm currently in the process of like finishing my first writing, finish writing my first short film. And yeah, you'll probably see it within like the next four months. Like I'll probably shoot it within the next two months. You'll probably see it within the next four months. It's not big, it's just one location, but it's, I think it'll be interesting. And if you like David Lynch, if you know who that is, you're gonna like this film. <laughs> if you need an extra, I'm available. <laughs> you just need me to walk in the back of the frame. I can totally do that. <laughs> oh, I don't think that can happen. But I'll for the next one. I will have Keep you. Keep me in mind. <laughs> actually, I have another screenplay. I actually might need you for that one. Yes, I've always wanted to be in a movie. <laughs> Even though like a, those random guys in the back of the of the screen. I want to show my mom. Mom, look, it's me in the corner right there for the past couple of seconds, but. Anyway, thank you so much for that. And again, thank you for coming on the show and thank you. Thank you.